Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. My name is Carrie Newhoff, and my goal is to help you lead like never before. So what I do every week is I sit down with world-class leaders and church leaders, business leaders, and I talk to them about what made them who they are and try to have the conversation with them that you would have if you got to sit down for lunch with them or have dinner with them or really got to spend some time with them. So we go into the backstory and we explore what made them who they are and some of the principles they've learned along the way. So if you enjoy this episode, I would love for you to like it, to subscribe, and also to share it with your friends. And in the meantime, here's today's episode. Harris, welcome to the podcast. Man, it's such an honor to be here. Yeah, we have a lot of mutual friends, first time meeting, but uh, you wrote a really fascinating book that uh, tells some of your story. You've had a pretty unique career starting out as an illusionist, as they sometimes say in Christian circles. Uh, how'd you get started with that? It's one of the things I love about Canadians is they're totally fine with the word magic. You say magic to a pastor or a church leader in the South and they're like, what is Whoa, going on? Oh <laughs> yeah. What are, what are you, what are you doing? Yeah. Canadians. We, and, and, you know, we're passive aggressive, so we might be nice to your face, but I'm kidding. Uh, yeah, yeah it doesn't really kidding. bother me. Although, you know, I, I joke, my wife's a pharmacist and, uh, I think the Greek for magic arts is pharmacon. And uh, so when you're reading the Greek New Testament, it's like those pharmacists. But anyway, I digress. <laughs> They're the ones that are in cahoots. They're the, the ones. Mm -hmm. Not the magicians. We will not inherit yeah. the kingdom That's of God. That's awesome. So anyway, I mean, that was an illusionist, kind of as we were saying. Yeah, it was, it was looked down upon. I grew up in a pretty conservative uh, small town in southeast Tennessee. My parents had minimum wage jobs. I was obsessed with baseball when I was a kid. Oh, cool. um, I wasn't good at baseball, but mm -hmm. I traded baseball cards at school played baseball with my cousins every day when I got off the school bus. And when I was nine, I asked for a baseball glove for Christmas and begged for it, went to the store, picked out the perfect glove, came home, told everyone which one it was. We open up our presents on Christmas morning. There's no baseball glove. We visit my grandparents in St. Louis a few days after Christmas, and there's a box under the tree that's the perfect size for a glove. I open it up, and it was a box of magic tricks. I have no idea where it came from was not interested in magic. I have no idea why my grandmother got that gift that year. It was the gift I never wanted that completely changed my life. No way. And so that was, uh, that's where it all began. It took a couple of years. Finally, I was like 11. I think when I finally got paid to actually do a show, it was $25 us, not a lot of money, but man, it put me on top Big of the box. world. So like, what, what flipped in you? Why, why did you decide to open the box? I mean, there's so many kids who got a gift and it's like, yeah, you know, exactly. sits in a closet and you put it at a yard sale one day. Yeah, it was set aside for a couple of days. Um, but I remember getting bored, opening it up, learning my first trick. You know, and like if anyone has ever learned a simple magic trick as a kid or as an adult, you learn the secret and you're like, that's it? Like that, what no one's going to be fooled trick? by that. It's called the ball vase trick. You take a little ball, put it inside of a little cup and you cover it with a lid and it disappears and you can make it reappear. And I learned it thinking no one's going to fall for it. I walk, I march into my living room. Yeah. So my mom and dad, they're watching TV and I'm like, gather around. Here's what grandma got me for Christmas, right? I put the ball in the cup. I covered up. It disappears. My parents' eyes lit up. They were like, how did you do that? And I'm like, I'm sorry. Seriously? They're like, how'd you do that? It was amazing. Yeah. And that's the first time I realized, well, I didn't realize it at the time, but now looking back, I realize how contagious wonder is because mm -hmm. it's the first time. Because I was, I was mostly getting bullied at school. Uh, you know, all our clothes came from yard sales and hand-me-down. I, I wasn't good at anything. And so it, at nine years old, it's the first memory I have of someone else looking at me with a look of awe and wonder in response to something that I had done. And that sort of flipped on my wonder switch and gave birth to a whole bunch of possibility and dreams and started thinking, maybe I'll do magic for the rest of my life. Wow. Wow. So that one trick, and obviously that kind of stuff can be a little bit addictive. And uh, pick up pick up the story. I mean, anybody who's been on stage, anyone who's been behind a microphone knows that the affirmation, what is it, Lady Gaga, we all live for the applause, right? So uh, yeah. yeah, I get it. So that was that was some affirmation along the way. And what happened after that? Yeah, I started traveling quite a bit. Uh, by the time I was about 14, 15 years old, um, I remember my principal sat down with my parents and said, hey, he's missing a lot of class. It's not really fair to the kids. We're super supportive of his magic. We recommend homeschooling him. So dropped out of public school. Uh, my parents jokingly called it hotel school, but started touring full-time <laughs> as a teenager. So by the time I was 16, I'd already performed in 
you know, probably 35, 40 states, multiple countries, cruise ships in the Caribbean. Um, okay, by I, I got to unpack yeah. that. <laughs> what makes you good at magic? What, like, what are, what are some of the characteristics that make somebody good at illusions where you can pull that off? Because I'm pretty sure if I was trying to pull a ball from a cup, it would like fall out of my sleeve <laughs> or, you know, bounce on the floor or hit them in the face or something. What makes you good at that kind of thing? The same thing that makes you a great communicator on stage, uh, mm-hmm. and it's your ability to tell a story, right? So I, again, I did not know this or understand this at the time, but I was not really a great magician. I was a great storyteller who just happened to do magic tricks. And so a trick is just a trick. And you know, when you just use tricks to perform you know, feats of amazement for people, mm-hmm. that often leaves them going, how did you do that? I want to know the secret. And they walk away from the show trying to figure it all out as if it was a bunch of puzzles presented as this like mental chess match, right? And you're like, oh, I'm not going to let him get me. I'm going to try to figure out the secret to all those tricks. And so I think what elevates, um, you know, the magic from trickery to an art form Hmm. is not just, can I deceive people? Can I really get one over on them? That's sort of belittling the audience and their intelligence. It's sort of inviting them into a story that's bigger than themselves to blur the line between illusion and reality so that they dis- they suspend their cynicism just long enough to go, hmm, maybe more is possible than I realized. Or maybe more is going on behind the scenes than just what I can see with my own eyes. And it's not because I'm trying to convince someone that I have supernatural powers. I don't insult the audience's intelligence. I tell them up front, everything you're going to see me perform on stage is obviously just a trick. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a whole bunch of things and truths that we can learn from the fact that we as human beings can be so easily deceived. How as a kid do you get a career that takes you around the world, ultimately pulls you out of school <laughs> and that probably at some point you made more than $25 doing, right? If, <laughs> like how, how does that happen? Because, you know, everybody knows the kid who knows the card trick or knows this, but obviously uh, this wasn't just friends and family. How did that spread for you? Yeah, it's like any other skill set. It has to be honed and developed. I obviously put in my 10,000 hours, as Malcolm Gladwell writes about, and combined with natural gifting, I think. You know, I wasn't gifted at the art of magic tricks, but I was certainly leaning into my strengths and how those strengths aligned with the skills that I was tangibly learning. Um, and then just putting it all into practice as often as possible. I mean, I, I didn't say no to anything in that season. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to go perform for little kids in living rooms at birthday parties. I didn't want to go perform inside nursing homes for, you know, senior citizens who couldn't applaud and at the, the way <laughs> fell asleep them, halfway through. Yeah. 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 Like that's, that's hard on your pride as a, in your late teenage years. But, you know, those really hard venues, those tough audiences, the, the high school and middle school gymnasiums with the bad sound systems and the creaking bleachers and the the two o'clock time slot where all the kids are at the end of their day and they're exhausted and ready to go home. Those are the moments that I said yes to that shaped me to become better at my craft. Um, and I think sometimes we shy away from the hard things because we don't want to do them. Um, but those are the those are the gifts that make us great at what we do. You said a lot of your success, even as a kid, was sort of built around storytelling, not just the practice of illusion. How do you, because you got a ton of communicators listening. So, you know, you got a lot of lead pastors listening, a lot of speakers, you have a lot of CEOs who have to cast vision, da, 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 da. How, How did you become good at storytelling, even as a teenager? Yeah, I mean, a lot of what I know now was just coming to me intuitively as a kid. Mm-hmm. I watched a lot of David Copperfield growing up. It okay. is, you know, at this era where he was doing lots of television specials. And I think he, the reason for his success is he was one of the first, you know, large scale illusionists who approached the art of magic through the lens of storytelling. Mm-hmm. And it was a way of expressing his worldview. Um, and I think that a lot of times we, we as communicators get so tied up in the data or the facts, um, the thing that the truth that we really want people to believe that sometimes we take it outside of the context of story and it ends up becoming less compelling um, and because it's absent of vulnerability, it's absent of illustration, it's absent of empathy. And those things sort of lessen the impact of all of those facts, so to speak. And so I, I early on just tried to embrace vulnerability by sharing examples and stories from my own life of how I had learned these things that I was trying to communicate. You know, great example, actually. I remember in my my mid-20s, I 
I'm fast forwarding a little bit through my story. So I'm happy to go back at any time if you want me to, but I'd made a million dollars doing magic shows by 21 and by 22, I was practically bankrupt. Um, I'd racked up a few hundred thousand dollars worth of debt by moving out of my small town, moving to the city, a wealthy suburb of Nashville, building a house, buying two expensive cars, all that stuff. But when everything came crashing down, I was like, I got to figure out what life's all about and didn't know the answers to the questions I was asking. I just knew that somehow magic was still a component of that. And I found myself at a school in the state of Michigan. It was in a public school. I was there to promote a bigger show that we were doing at a local theater that night. And I remember I was, I was leaning up against the wall of the gym. The principal came in and was like, hey, you're the magician. Uh, you know how to trick people. Go out there and tell those kids how they're getting tricked and making the choices they're making. And I was like, I don't. I don't know how to do that. I'm not a motivational speaker or whatever it is that you want me to be. I'm an entertainer. I'm here to do a magic show. Um, I'm compelled by this challenge, hmm. I remember closing that show with a straight jacket escape. So a la Harry Houdini, get out of a straight jacket. And I remember holding up the straight jacket and saying, listen, I don't know what your straight jacket is. As you were watching me, you know, I'm sure it was painful. Like that was excruciating. Getting out of a straight jacket is really hard. I don't know what your straight jacket is. Here are some of the straight jackets that I've had to fight my way out of over my lifetime, from addiction to depression to debt, all these things. Whatever your straight jacket is, I want you to know there is hope. Never give up. Never give up. And then, of course, as a communicator, you know how this feels like. You give what you feel like is not a very good presentation, mm -hmm. and then you're, you're beating yourself up in your head backstage or as the audience is filing out. I'm doing that. I'm just like, oh, my gosh, that was horrible. What was I thinking? I should have just ignored the principle. And then this girl starts walking down the bleachers, beelining it towards me with, you know, bawling, has tears rolling down her cheeks. And she says, hey, I have something for you. I'm like, what is it? She goes, uh, it's my straight jacket. And she's holding out her hand. And I cut my hands and she dropped her razor blade into my hand and said, that's my straight jacket. I don't want it anymore. And no one's ever given me hope like you did today. Oh, my goodness. That's a powerful changing moment that you describe. I, I do have to ask for all the youth pastors who are poorly paid, they want to know how, how do you, how do you make a million dollars a year and then, and then like go bankrupt? That's a, it's a great question. Yeah. Well, by believing a whole bunch of stories about yourself that aren't true uh, and how the world works, you know, I, this, this could take us, take us right out, way down the rabbit hole into storytelling and the fact that we are storytelling creatures as human beings. But, mm -hmm. you know, the principles of deception that magicians use to trick people are pretty universal. You know, if, if someone uses a principle that I use in a magic trick to help someone, they call them a great leader. If someone bad comes along and uses that same principle to take advantage of someone, they call them a con man. And wow. so the that, but it's the same principle. So the principles of magic tricks are really just the same principles of persuasion and psychology that make it possible to influence anyone to believe anything. And so an illusionist is someone who leads someone to tell themselves a story that isn't true. And perhaps one of the biggest ironies in my story is that in my process of traveling around the world tricking people, you know, I was cleverly tricked and deceived myself. And so that's really the short answer to the question is by the time I was 21, I mean, my my identity was totally wrapped up in trying to maintain and control the perceptions of other people so they could see me the way I wanted them to see me. Um, you know, and you, you mentioned that Lady Gaga quote earlier. Um, you know, Lecrae said that if you live for the applause or approval of others, you'll end up dying by their rejection. Mm. And so I, that's how I felt. You know, I built the right house in the right part of town, drove the right cars, hang out with the right celebrities wore the right jeans, did all the right things so that all of my friends and family and the people who went to my church and my dad, especially, you know, could drive down my street and go, man, look at That's him That's my son. Look at him. Yeah. Yeah. I was trying to prove that I was enough, basically. Do you think that was influenced in part by growing up without a lot of things? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. It's because I was desperately looking for belonging, right? Like it wasn't an attachment to stuff. I wasn't selfish. The reason I wanted nice things is not because I was greedy. It was because I was insecure and was lacking a sense of love and belonging. And so it was about finding that community to get plugged into, rooting my identity and value in something that was more divine than the flakiness of the mob. <laughs> <So> yeah. <laughs> 
uh, and becoming grounded. So I didn't have to find my value in the perceptions that I was trying to control or the show I was putting on. What have you called yourself a Christian? Um, like at the time all that happened and you had all the money and the fame, like, yes, I certainly would have used that label for sure. You know, I don't think that I was actually following Jesus or being obedient to what it looks like to walk by faith, but would have certainly used the label from a religious perspective. And honestly, the church enforced it, right? Reinforced that, that notion. Um, the more I, the better I became at communicating and telling stories, the more I was able to use my craft as an illusionist to clearly articulate stories from scripture, including the gospel. And so if you start to view the gospel as a product and the church as a marketplace, the entrepreneur in me was really good at aligning those two things and doing lots of quote unquote business with the church. And so in my early twenties, I mean, I could not have been any more cynical towards the ideas of faith because everything had been so commercialized. Isn't that, you know, okay, that I, I want to go in 20 different directions. Let me pick, <laughs> let me pick cynicism because that occurred to me. I thought if, if you think about like that line between, you know, an evangelist and a con man or a CEO <laughs> or a lead pastor and a con man, that's, that's definitely worth chasing because we see that flip in the headlines all the time, right? Mm -hmm. This guy who was apparently good turned out he was taking money from, or he was this, or he was having an affair or he was, you know, whatever. And those powers of persuasion, it's such a thin line, but let's go to cynicism. Because if you can create an illusion um, and you know what it is to trick people into or to convey an image, how does that not make you cynical? Like you kind of see through everything, right? It's almost that deconstructionism where you see through things so much to see that there is nothing left. Like what, what was that like for the soul of a 21-year-old? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of what you're outlining my journey exactly into my mid twenties. Yeah. You know, it was this sort of cynical, I'll believe it when I see it sort of mindset. And it's, it was born out of traveling around the world, exposing deception. You know, when, when I went bankrupt at 22 and said, how did this happen to me? And then you have that aha moment of like, oh, these principles of deception are universal. And I was tricked by the world the same way that I trick people on stage. Once you have the aha moment, it sort of set off this passion within me to be like, I'm going to travel around the world and expose deception wherever I find it. And so I was like the guy with the megaphone going, hey, the matrix is real. The matrix <laughs> is real. Um, but there's so much fake to expose. Like there's so much deception in the world to tell people yeah. about. And when you spend you know, almost a decade, which I did, traveling around the world showing people what's fake, it's really easy to forget and lose your grasp on what's real. And that's where I found myself. You know, cynicism, Bob Goff, I love, he said, you know, cynicism is fear posing as confidence. Mm. I love that idea. When you look at that through the lens of a magician, you know, magicians somewhat prove that seeing is not always believing. In fact, magic tricks work so easily because human beings think that the truth is equal to what our senses perceive, which is obviously not true. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to trick you with a magic trick, right? But when you become cynical, you sort of live as if seeing is believing. Like, oh, I'll believe that when I see it. As if seeing something or hearing something or feeling something, even with your emotions, is equal to what the truth says. And that's just not the case. And so I think the shift from cynicism is moving from seeing is believing to believing is seeing because all the neuroscience supports the idea that what we believe has the power to change what we see. Hmm. Not in like a woo woo new age. Sort right. Of right. It's not like, the oh, power of positive like, thinking. Or, yeah. No, I wish this thing secret. away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I just hope for it hard enough, it'll manifest itself in my life. But what it's do like, you mean by that? Believing is seeing. This is fascinating. Yeah. I mean, like we all have an example of someone we know, usually a family member or a friend, or it's like, why can't he see it? Why can't she see the truth? It's right there in front of their face. Or an example of as a leader, there was an innovative solution to a problem that you couldn't see before. And all those things come out of an assumption or a belief, right? As a leader, you can't see the innovative solution because you didn't believe it was possible. You started from a place of assuming like, there's not a problem out there for the solution or, oh no, we're screwed. Let's just quit it all right now. Yeah. Right. Or the family or friend who can't see the truth. It's not that that truth doesn't exist or that it isn't right in front of their face. 
is that they believe a lie that tells them otherwise and their belief isn't permitting them to see accurately. And so we have to start from our belief systems to get to a place where we're able to see more clearly. Can you say a little bit more about that line, like the same skill set that's used to persuade people for good can also be leveraged by the con man? I think there's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> well, it's the, and yeah. it's very, I mean, those of us who are in leadership, we're in the, the power of persuasion. And I mean, my preaching, my leadership comes out of core convictions and belief that I think are true. But I think you're right, you know, and sometimes you see that, like you see that with with leaders who are like, oh man, you're so malevolent. But if you could turn this to good, like do you know how much good could be used because the powers of persuasion or leadership or vision or or the ability to mobilize people, you're right. It's It's a thin line between using it well and using it for evil. Talk about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it, I don't think it's as clear as just black and white. Is it good or evil? It is, when I say it's universal, I can literally say that I can make, I can cut a lady in half and put her back together again using the same principles of psychology or make it appear that I can. I yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see that one, Harris. Like, yeah, if exactly. you don't mind, that would be fascinating. Right, right? Or me, like, see if that works on me. <laughs> yeah. You'd, you'd be half the man you are now. So you don't <laughs> that. Here come the dad jokes. Um, no, I, I can make that illusion possible with the same principles of psychology that are used to sell cars and make up or craft a political speech that would help a politician win an election, right? Mm. So it's not that are, are they good or evil. It's just that these, these skill sets and strengths and gifting can be used in so many different ways. Yeah. Uh, and like in the same way that we see a lot of leaders use their powers for good, they could also use them to manipulate. And so I think we have to be really careful. So I think it's really about conviction um, and how we're using those. To me, leadership is just, it's simply inviting someone into a story. It's, I have a vision of the world, my attempt to restore order in the world by stirring your imagination and offering you a better story than the one that you currently find yourself in. That person goes, that sounds great. I'm willing to go follow you. I want that world, right? Conning someone is really no different. You're selling someone a story and they're buying into it hook, line, and sinker. And they think that story is better than the one they find themselves in. It's just you use the story to rip the rug out from underneath them and take advantage of them and con them. It's so, still leadership. Yeah, go ahead. It's just still leadership because you're still leading someone into yeah, you are. something or an action or a story. Yeah. That's uh, very fair. Um, leadership and cynicism are frequent companions. The more you know, the more <laughs> you see, the more cynical you get. I, right. I take it perhaps you're not quite as cynical as you were at 21, 22. <laughs> what was that journey away from that low point like for you? How did you get enough hope to like have sure. kids, pedal hope? Like you're doing yeah. less illusion these days and more just helping people craft stories. But what was the journey out of that cynical pit like? Yeah, I would even say I'm doing less illusions, but I'm doing a lot more magic. Um, because I'm trying to differentiate the two, right? Like magic is not something that you see a magician perform on stage, even though that's what we call it. But there's irony in the fact that we call it magic, even though it's just a trick, but yet there are very real things that are truly magical in us and in the world around us that we sort of roll our eyes with cynicism at and we assume it doesn't matter. So I think when I watch leaders get cynical, it's simply because they've lost the magic. Um, Andy Stanley says, when you lose your why, you lose your way. Mm. I think that has a lot to do with it. You know, that to answer your question more directly, it happened to me around 30 years old. Um, you know, I, I was in that decade that I was telling you about, about traveling the world, exposing everything I could find that was fake and deception and exposing the lies, but had forgotten what the truth was. I was at a 4th of July event doing a fire breathing act, which is, you know, sounds crazy, but it's, when you're a magician, you do stunts, you jump in tanks of water wearing straight jackets or chains, <laughs> you walk across shards of glass barefoot, you just do weird things, right? And you get really comfortable with them. And so it's something I'd done hundreds of times, got too comfortable, made a really foolish mistake, and I set my face on fire for about six seconds. Ooh. Ended up ended up with second degree burns all over my face and my, oh my mouth. Um, obviously had a few weeks of no shows, uh, canceled tour, was laying on the couch feeling sorry for myself. And dude, was getting 
torn to shreds, completely ridiculed by peers online in the entertainment industry. Um, like, what a fool. Can't believe he did that. And a Actually lot of that lit was, yourself on fire. Are you kidding me? Like that yeah, kind of like thing. What, like, yeah, I can't believe he made such a foolish mistake. And, and they're right. The mistake was really foolish, as if none of them had ever you know, <laughs> made mistakes or had any accidents. But that was a lot related to my faith and my worldview. And that's another whole story. But all these things combined to lead me to a place of, and it's pretty dark. I didn't have a lot of hope. And I was ready to quit and hang up my uh, proverbial top hat, so to speak. And I had certainly lost the magic, which again is, you know, I'd seen the wonders of the world. I'd seen, I'd walked the Great Wall of China. I'd seen the Taj Mahal. I had stood at the edge of the Grand Canyon, Niagara Falls. I'd seen the pyramids in Egypt three times on tours in the Middle East. And what took me to those wonders of the world was my ability to make other people wonder, was to awaken their wonder. But yet I'd lost my wonder that permitted me to see the magic. So I was ready to quit. And as I'm laying on the couch, I look down at the living room floor and I see a little nine-month-old boy that my wife had given birth to nine months previously. And it's not that I hadn't seen Jude, my son, at nine months old. I had been working towards being aware and present, but I'd yet to see the world through his eyes, through his lens. And man, he saw magic everywhere. And, and I remember having this aha moment of like, it's all right here in front of my face. It The magic is in the mundane things. Sure, it's cool to watch a beautiful sunset or to go on vacation with your family and have those mountaintop experiences or Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon or the Taj Mahal. Like, of course, those things are wonders of the world, but wonder is like right here at my feet. And it kept happening. We'd go out on the back and we'd blow bubbles and Jude would not just see just bubbles. I would see just bubbles. Jude would see magic. Um, and I would say before my cynicism crushed the wonder of my kids, God used me becoming a dad to reawaken wonder in my life and really show me what real magic is, um, which is why I think I can say I've, I'm doing fewer illusions, but really trying to help people perform their own brand of magic because it's in them, it's in everything around us. And the irony, you know, if you look at it through the lens of faith, if you look at the account of creation, God made all the stuff that we usually marvel at we look up at the stars and we're like, wow, those are amazing. Sometimes now we're usually looking down at stars on our phones, right? Yeah. But we look up at the stars and we're like, wow. And then we look in the mirror and we're like, eh. But yet God looked at that stuff and said it was good. And then he looked at us after he created us in his image and was like, wow, that's really good. So how much more magic is there in us than even the stars in the sky? But we've lost our ability to marvel at it because we no longer believe in magic. And to me, that is how I would define cynicism. It's, I live as if seeing is believing. And like Roald Dahl famously said, those who don't believe in magic will never find it. So if you spend the, your entire adult life thinking, oh, magic, I'll believe in that when I see it, you'll never find it because you have to believe in it before you can see it. That's fascinating, you know, and, and, and it's wonderful to see you a few years later um, with that wonder kind of recaptured, I went through a, a cynical period myself, but a decade after you did, it was my thirties that led me down a cynical slope. And, mm. you know, you still feel memories of it sometimes, but it's that idea of wonder since not traveling this year, six, seven months in my backyard, I'm just getting to know the birds and really enjoying watching all the seasons. And it's in those yeah. little things. And like you, I've had the privilege of traveling the world, uh, maybe not as extensively, but um, it's funny how how you just see things differently. I'm interested in your 20s because you've said a couple of times now you went around exposing all the fake that you could see. What did that look like? Because I feel like that feels like the internet today. And it's not always the most encouraging thing. I'm not saying that truth telling doesn't have a role. It does. But like, gosh, that seems to be the spirit of the age. And you did that in your 20s. So what what did that yeah. involve for you? Yeah. It, and I realized... Um, as wisdom says, that the medium is the message. Mm. Uh, and when when I started connecting the dots between how magic tricks work and how all lies work, I essentially shifted my performance of magic tricks to sort of showcase and illustrate these different principles of deception. Um, an example of that, a lot of people ask, is misdirection. It's one of the many yeah. principles that make magic tricks possible. So in, in the magic industry, we call it misdirection, which we think is as simple as like, hey, psst, look over there, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it is that simple, but 
a lot of times we're using our language, um, everything we do with an audience volunteer on stage to sort of psychologically condition them to open up to the story that we want them to tell themselves, which makes the distraction a lot easier to accomplish. Um, but that happens to us all the time. You know, every time a phone buzzes, um, every time we get a notification of a like on Instagram, um, all the TV channels that we're surrounded yeah. by, and we take in four to 5,000 messages and ads a day now. Some studies say as many as 10,000 messages a day. That's a lot of misdirection trying to divert our focus and put it on things that don't matter as much. So I spent most of that decade, you know, illustrating a principle by saying, hey, let me show you a magic trick. Now let me pull the curtain back a little bit. I'm going to show you the secret that I used to make that magic trick possible. And now that I've shown you the secret and you've been enlightened, I'm going to fool you again just to keep things fun. Um, so I'm going to use that same principle and turn it around and try to trick you again, just so you walk away feeling so like So your hey, show became kind of a deconstruction, reconstruction Show and thing. tell, yeah. Now, yeah. did your colleagues hate you for that? I heard that's one of the things you can't do in magic is give away the secret or it was no big yeah, deal. Sure. Yeah, no, it was it was pretty split. Split like within the magic industry, it was like a love hate relationship. Some guys loved my style uh, because you know, and then but there's just this hardcore belief among a lot of magicians that if you don't believe in the magic, then they won't believe in the magic. And by they, I mean the audience. Um, and one, it's not magic; they're just tricks. And two, like why insult the intelligence of the people that you're performing for? Like they don't. No one goes to magic shows thinking it's. Some supernatural. Yeah. They know there's a trick, and it's am I going to yeah. see anything that allows me to yeah, guess what yeah. it is? Right. And there's some validity to that. Like you know, when you make something levitate, your ability to like really focus and sell the magic itself to sell that story to the audience increases the effectiveness of them suspending that belief, mm. um, but not to believe in it to the point where you know they're convinced that I actually have the power to make something levitate. So. Um, yeah, it was it was split. It was mixed mixed reviews. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then you pivoted in the last few years. Uh, you've been talking a lot about story. In fact, uh, you acquired an organization, a company called Story, and you're training leaders and makers and creators and artists in the art of story. Um, talk about that pivot and what that involved for you. Yeah, it really came out of that experience, that story I told you earlier with that young girl in the high school and the straitjacket escape. And, you know, when I walked away from that experience, it took me a few years, but I was desperate to understand, okay, why am I telling everyone that the matrix is real, essentially? But why are they going, I want the whichever color pill it was, right? Like mm. they'd rather just live. <laughs> yeah, as if, I can't. I can't um, yeah. Yeah. And so, what color it was either. <laughs> we we made this documentary called Counterfeit and we went into Times Square to do like man on the street filming and I'll never forget like you know I was going to go in and be like hey are you aware that the world is trying to deceive you and being able to point up at all these ads and talk about the thousands of messages we take in and I I expected foolishly uh to and ignorantly to think people are going to be like what they're like trying to deceive us and 100% of the people we put a microphone in the face of said, oh, yeah, like, every, every, look around, man. Everything's trying to get me to, like, buy these. And I was like, oh, so you guys already know? So then why does no one care? So it's like we're going about our lives aware of the fact that we're being duped, but we don't care enough or aren't tuned in enough or awake to it enough to make the necessary changes to lead. Um, and that was so fascinating to me. And that's what I wanted to understand is, how can someone, what, what's driving human behavior? What's driving the way that we shape our views of the world? And that's really where I discovered the power that storytellers have. You know, Plato often gets summarized by saying, he who tells the stories rules the world or society. Steve Jobs from Apple said, he, the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. And, and we often get tied up in politics or these different sectors of culture that we think are so important to change. And it's not that they aren't, but before politicians start arguing about a new law or legislation, all they're doing is changing and rewriting laws to reflect public opinion. And public opinion is usually based on a narrative that was introduced by storytellers, artists, entertainers, communicators, speakers, marketers. And so they introduce these narratives, they get adopted as true. Doesn't mean if they actually are true or not. But the narratives that we adopt as true, usually formed in childhood, starts driving all of the choices we make and all human behavior. 
Because we as story, we as human beings walk around all day long telling ourselves stories to make sense of the world, to figure out what choices to make, how to behave, how to stay safe, how to dream. In fact, we do that so often, even when we go to sleep at night, our brain stays up all night long telling ourselves more stories. And so I became fascinated by, well, if storytellers have this much power, someone ought to be gathering them together to have a conversation about that collective power so that we can do better. So that's how Story was born. Um, found out that conference was already going on, had a chance to speak at it, uh, and then found out it was going to go away. So we acquired it, reinvented it, started building a new community. Apple started coming. Disney Imagineers started coming. Google started coming. And it just kind of blew up. Um, and now it's just this community to have regular conversations around the power we have as storytellers. Wow. wow. So you have a lot of storytellers here. And by story, you don't necessarily mean myth. I mean, you have a lot of preachers here and, and sure. you know, you have a faith conviction yourself, as do I. Uh, and I tend to be the bullet point guy. Uh, but I also <laughs> realize that the storytellers really do hold all the power and somewhere in there is a narrative. So uh, mm -hmm. talk to all the storytellers about the, the power of story and how it can be leveraged for, um, yeah, for good too. Yeah. Well, storytelling has kind of become a buzzword lately, you know, and everyone's fascinated by story's power because of its ability to convert, right? That's why marketers are obsessed with it. Salespeople are obsessed with it. And I think it's also why the church is becoming obsessed with it because we hear about, again, it's, it's effective, it's power, it's, it's ability to, and all the neuroscience that shows its ability to hijack the human brain and pull someone in and captivate their attention. But story's greatest power is not in its ability to convert. It's in its ability to connect. Um, and because that connection offers this exchange of empathy, um, that if, if you start and lead with connection first, the conversion is so much more authentic and effective uh, and long-term. And so leaders at companies who are coming to storytelling because like, oh, we need, we need sales conversions, we need sales conversions. <laughs> what they're finding is that they're sort of hijacking story's power to accomplish conversion, but the conversion is short-lived and they're not building long-term successful organizations. And I think we can learn from that data as well as communicators in the church. How do we lead with connection? Because we need that exchange of empathy more now, I think, than we ever have, oh, yeah. uh, at least in my lifetime. And so we need great storytellers to, to help us do that. You know, I think one of the biggest takeaways I've been thinking about lately in the context of communication in the church, and a lot of us have been talking about this in the context of faith conversations in the film industry. Mm. There's always that moment at the end of the Christian film where it's like the hair light comes on. So the person looks like an angel and yeah. then there's the conversion moment. Right. Um, and there's a great book out called story by a legendary storyteller named Robert McKee. And in there, he goes off on this tangent about his opinion around voiceover in film. Um, because in film, he feels like voiceover is cheating and it's your way of advancing the story instead of having actors actually act it out for you. And I, when, I, when I read that in the book, I was like, I feel like that's what a lot of pastors and preachers do, is we have a tendency to tell a story for the sake of being motivated by conversion, and then we get to the end of the story and we say, okay, and the takeaway is, or the moral of the story is, and you're sort of taking what you want people to get out of a story and sort of serving it up to them on a silver platter. So I started experimenting. I was doing this breakout at a pastor's conference uh, called Exponential a couple of years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was just talking was, to Todd Wilson. Yep. Oh, cool. Great oh, guys. Wow. I love Todd. Yeah. So I'm doing this breakout. It's all pastors in the room. And I was like, I, I just want to experiment. This isn't me trying to teach you guys something necessarily. It's the first chance I've had a chance to do this. Um, and I just told a story. I, I did a magic trick to make it more fun. Just, just told the story. And at the end of the story, instead of stopping and going, Okay, now here's what I want you to believe, or here's the moral of the story. I just said, raise your hand if you felt like you just learned something, or you were moved on a heart level, or something hit you, or you feel like God spoke to you. It was a wide net, right? It's like 90% of the room, hands went up. One by one, I went around, and no two people said the same thing. And what I realized is that for years, I'd been telling that story in my show and at the end of it saying, and the moral of the story is, but yet the moral and takeaway I was sharing with my audiences was not mentioned by any of the people who raised their hand. Wow. And what I realized is that stories are these living, breathing, magical things, and that God through his spirit can often use them to communicate in ways that we can't. And it doesn't mean that we never, you know, 
we never say, and the moral of the story is, or as you said, give them their bullet point takeaways. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I do think there's, it's probably valid to have a conversation around, should we leave more room to allow stories to do their magical work and to let God use them instead of us doing what Robert McKee says, you know, writers do with voiceovers, which is cheat by taking what they want to say and just giving it to them. No, you know, like Jesus walks around telling stories that we're still debating the meaning over. (laughs) And, you know, once in a while he pulls his disciples aside and he goes, okay, guys, I know you can't figure this out, but you know, the seed is this. They asked him often, right? They were like, they'd be like, what? (laughs) <laughs> and and even even like the Old Testament, the Old Testament, if you really read it for real, is like enraging. It's like, Jacob, are you kidding me? Jacob, yeah. like, come on, I need some Romans here to interpret Jacob because uh, it doesn't make any sense. And we're uncomfortable with ambiguity, uh, yes. I think, often in leadership. Yes. We... We want to drive to a point. Talk, talk to us about that. Like, why yeah. why are we so uncomfortable with that? I know that's a form of control <laughs> as a recovering control freak. Uh, and I, I love preaching out of Paul. Paul's a lot more convenient and antiseptic than Jesus. I can tell you that. A hundred percent true, for sure. A lot less parables and a lot more getting to the point. Yeah. Uh, and and that's, that's why so much of my work is at the intersection of storytelling and wonder. Right. The reason why stories to me are so captivating, at least the ones that are well told, are the ones that leave room for mystery. You know, like this, this device has mm. psychologically reconditioned me and everyone else who has one in their pocket. Think about a magic show a hundred years ago. If you would have walked into a theater to watch a magic show, the moment that you saw something amazing, you would have just said, Wow, that was incredible. That's hard to imagine that that's what you would have done because all you know is what you know. If you sit in a theater and see something like me do something amazing, what do you do? You Google it. Yeah, Google it. Oh, yeah, Google the trick or try to capture it. It's like, exactly. can't you just enjoy the moment? (laughs) No, we can't because surely there's a YouTube video that can explain this to me in 30 seconds. And so what's happening is in the information age, not, not only the information age, but now we have the information in our pockets at our fingertips rapidly. That has sort of psychologically reconditioned an entire generation now to feel really uncomfortable with mystery to the point where Mm. I think wonder feels disruptive. Because when we come in contact with something we don't understand, there is no forced, you know, I just have to live within this mystery. So go back to the 100 years ago example. You couldn't pull out your phone. You just had to be comfortable with mystery. And in fact, when you walked out of the theater, you were surrounded by other things that were mysterious. If you wanted to call a friend and tell them about the magic show, you had to pick up this little device and hold it up to your ear. And no one understood how it worked. It was like, I talk into this thing and like my voice goes over there miles away, right? No one had the ability to understand how everything worked. And so I think there was this comfort level, but now we live in an abundance of certainty or at least under the illusion of an abundance of certainty. And now it's no wonder that it's difficult to have things like faith. It's difficult to yeah. believe in something that can't be explained to us because wonder feels so uncomfortable. And so to take that full circle, what I think great storytellers do is they don't just tell stories as a way of communicating A, B, C, D, E, here's all the black and white truths. Stories aren't just illustrations of truth. Stories open up possibility and stir people's wonder and imagination to invite their brain to explore what might be possible. Well, and, you know, your idea of knowledge and Googling the magic trick while you're watching it, um, that really does play into the cynicism of the age. I wrote a book that had a chapter on cynicism in it. And when I first started auditioning in material, I'm older. So it's like, well, you know what? Like, if you're under 40, this doesn't apply to you. And I had a whole line of like 23 year olds going, I'm so cynical. I'm so cynical. Oh, yeah. And I'm like, oh, okay. Well, I wasn't when I was 23, but that was a while ago. So, you know, I wonder if that instant knowledge has something. Your book's called The Wonder Switch. Mm-hmm. And I see that thread from getting to know you a little bit in this interview that you you seem to be able to turn that back on to say, no, I, I don't have to live in this cynical morass. So, uh, do you want to talk? We got a lot of young leaders listening right now. Do you want to talk to them about that? Uh, sure. And can you turn the wonder switch on? Like, what what does that mean? What does that look like? Yeah, sure, you can. Yeah, in the book, I I outlined something that I just called the transformation map, and it's this circle, 
And it really kind of showcases the process of how we move from an old story to a new one and how all change is defined by that. And um, on one of the, there's two lines and the axis is the wonder switch. And so the reason why the map is in a circle is because the reality is most of us go throughout our entire lives with the wonder switch being flipped on, off, on, off, on, off. And the goal is to grow in wisdom and truth so that we live more and more of our lives with the switch turned on. Um, But the way that we turn it on is actually, it's less about us finding something that we've never had like wonder. Right. And going back to our original state, we came into the world with the wonder switch turned on. So wonder is our natural state of being. It's how God wired us. We were wired. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Little side note tangent. For those listening, they're like, I don't, I don't know if I'm in on wonder. It feels like a soft skill when it comes to leadership. When I say it's our natural state and that we're wired for wonder, the latest neuroscience shows that a presence of awe and wonder can decrease stress, boost your immune system. It even increases the cytokines in your body, which is related to chronic inflammation. So just being in a positive awe state can decrease chronic inflammation in your body that's contributing to long-term disease. So all the neuroscience is just supporting more and more that this is the way that God wired us to live. Okay. Uh, is there any connection between wonder and ideation? Yes, of course. Yeah. I, I would think that's a natural, almost a straight line <laughs> because you think about what leaders do. We better have some really good imagination or else you are in the point where you have no fresh ideas, no anything. And I, I, as I've recovered my wonder, I have become better at generating ideas. Yes. Okay. So, so much we could talk about in this area. I'll try to not lose track of it all. First first of all, all the science links creativity and innovation to curiosity. Yes. You can't have curiosity without a presence of wonder because wonder is a state. I think of it as a noun. Curiosity is a verb. Curiosity is wonder in action. And Mm. so the flipping on of the wonder switch is what permits you to be curious. But you said something else interesting there because you said leaders have to have a good imagination I think that all human beings have a great imagination. When we are little kids, our imagination is incredibly active. That's what we think. And then as we grow up, the common myth is that our imagination becomes less active and we have to tap back into the childlike, you know, active imagination. But if you look at adults, we are using our imaginations every single day to to answer a simple question as storytelling creatures. And that is, what happens next in this story? So when your central nervous system freaks out, when you're in the passenger seat of a car and that car is being driven poorly, your your nervous system is freaking out because you as a storytelling creature is activating your imagination and it's filling in the blank. What happens next? Well, my brain, my imagination doesn't like what happens next. I think we're going to end up in a ditch somewhere and I might die. So therefore, fight, flight or freeze, right? So your imagination is trying to keep you alive. So your imagination is never less active It's never inactive. We simply misuse our imagination. Mm. And so what I believe is that the wonder switch toggles how we use it. So worry and anxiety is a misuse of imagination. Creativity, innovation, visioneering, those are the proper uses of imagination. Mm. But it's always at work. Isn't that fascinating? No, I love I love that narrative. And that is a, a different take on a lot of what you read. So... Um, drill down a little bit more on how to rekindle um, wonder. Because yeah. I do think the longer you lead, the more that feels suppressed. The more you end up like you did, you know, before you saw your nine-month-old. And you're like, wow. I, I One of my favorite books from when I was a kid was Ecclesiastes. And I reread it every year. And I'm like, wow, there's a guy who lost his wonder, right? Like he, he Absolutely. just did. And uh, it's not prescriptive, it's descriptive. And it seems the more money, more power, more success, more influence you have, the harder it is to keep it alive. Absolutely. The longer you live. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. You know, in in Ecclesiastes, when you get into meaning, whether something is meaning or meaninglessness, there's nothing new, right? It's this place of being stuck in complacency. Nihilism. I think it's, yeah, you have to get back to that place of meaning. And I connect that meaning and purpose with whether you lost the magic or not. So, you know, I don't know your backstory, but when you felt called to become a pastor, when you stepped into this season of leadership, there was some magic that you saw in it. Mm -hmm. And over time, if you lose sight of that magic, again, when you lose your why, you lose your way. 
And so if you get out of that natural state of wonder, that's when you start going to the place of cynicism. And the real question is, well, then how do we get back to that? Yeah. And again, it's really a question of how do we get back to our natural state, which means there's, there's almost like a blockage. We have to figure out what's turning off the switch if the on position is where we started. So how do we get back to the place where we began? Which means how do we get back to a childlike state of mind? Um, and I think cynicism lies to us and says, hey, don't do that. That's childish. There's so much pressure now to like man up and be a leader and like, you know, it's time to put away childish things. But it's ironic that, was it Paul that said that, right? Put away yeah, childish. Yeah, yeah, First Corinthians but then, 13, yeah. But then Jesus said, have the mind of a child. Like, yeah. and in fact, unless you even Become have the like mind a of child, God, you'll never even enter the kingdom of God. Like, mm-hmm. that's a pretty big statement, right? And so, how do we put away childish things but remain childlike? And that's the real question. And I keep coming back to story. So there was a narrative that you adopted as true in your childhood. It was based on what the world showed you, what adults that you trusted showed you. And the first step in the transformation map that sort of sucks us out of a place of wonder and magic is an inciting incident, a negative inciting incident that blindsides us and leads to trauma. And we misunderstand trauma. I think in 2020, uh, a lot of us have experienced more trauma than we realized, or we have experiences that have shaped us that we don't look as as traumatic, but most psychological experts and studies would identify as trauma. Well, that unresolved trauma, that ability to not make sense of that story breaks the narrative. It produces shame, produces lies that you repeat back to yourself. And those untrue stories that you tell yourself form a narrative that has a bunch of holes in it. And so to get back to wonder is really about doing the hard work of restoring your narrative that's driving all of your behavior and thinking and choices, which requires some radical self-inquiry, right? We got to look in the mirror and figure out what stories am I telling myself that are shaping what I believe to be true? And are those stories actually true? And if they're not, I've got to do some work to restore that narrative and get back to a place of truth. And usually that has to do with healing from that trauma. What has that journey been like for you? Like, what, is, what are some of the stories that you're starting to believe again that spring out of your faith or out of your experience sure. over the last few years? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you have gotten into the enneagram or not. I know. It's yeah, yeah, we've had Ian Morgan like, Cron on before, and uh, yeah, yeah, people are like crazy fans or super against it and think it's mm-hmm. of the devil. It's all across the board. I, I am a three on the enneagram. I struggle to feel loved for who I am which is why I produce, 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 produce. Mm -hmm. So in my own story, so much of it has to do with worthiness, right? This feeling of enoughness, which again is why I built that big fancy house and filled it up with nice leather furniture and drove expensive cars when I was 21. Was trying to show the world like, hey, I'm enough. Do you love me now? So a lot of it has been about understanding that I am worthy of love and belonging just because I'm a human being created in the image of God. Um, And And becoming a father helped a lot with that because Mm. I could suck on stage and have a horrible presentation, give a bad talk and felt like I totally bombed, but then walk through my front door and to my kids, I'm a rock star. They don't love me because I'm anything on stage. They just love me because I'm their dad. And that's been really healing for me. And it's allowed me and given me permission to be more vulnerable with the traumatic experiences of my childhood. You know, I I dealt with some childhood abuse in my childhood. I dealt with some addiction in my teenage years. And I didn't feel like that was trauma that needed to be dealt with because it's like, oh, I moved on. I fixed it. I'm all good, right? (laughs) Yeah. As if there was no work to do in that area. What I now understand is that trauma is stored in the lower third limbic system in our brains which is also a section of our brains that participates in a lot of active storytelling. My friend Mark Pimsler taught me that the goal of healing and a corrective experience when it comes to trauma is moving what he calls that trauma up and to the left, which takes it out of that active storytelling part of your brain so that you're no longer trigger, triggered by that trauma where you're like, oh no, that yeah. thing's happening again. So instead of staying trapped in those untrue stories, I can look at that experience of trauma as a whole body experience and honor it and go, Okay, I'm not saying that wasn't real. That definitely happened. It happened in the past. I healed from it. I'm in a different story now. And even though it happened in the past, it's not happening now, which equips me with the ability to respond to those that trauma and not allow it to trigger me and suck me back into that old story. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's so much work. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I've been through uh, some of those journeys myself. And yeah. uh, that is a lot of work. But you know it's what I love fairness. is you got so much hope. 
Like I feel it. There's and for those of you who are watching on YouTube, you'll see it. Like there's a there's a joy there that must have been quite absent at 24. Oh man, yeah. I look back and I'm just like, what was fueling me? I think the fuel was just the search. The something kept my wonder switch was not turned on, but there was enough of a spark that led to another spark to keep my hope alive long enough to lead me back to a place of wonder. Um, and I'm so grateful for that because I don't know. It was a pretty dark season for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you say two of the most powerful words in the English language are what if. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we can fill that blank in with something really awful by misusing our imagination or we can fill it in with something really hopeful and positive. And a lot of people are using their what ifs on their past. You know, what if I would have done it differently? What if I wouldn't have said yes oh, to yeah. that? That would have happened. And I think we, what if becomes so much more effective when we use it on the future. Okay, what if I fail? Yeah, but what if you succeed? You know, you connected wonder in your words earlier to innovation. The reason why is because wonder gives you permission to believe in that new story. People ask me all the time how I would define wonder. And I think if I had to nail it down to a single sentence, it's that, is that wonder gives you permission to believe in what you have yet to see. So if cynicism says seeing is believing, wonder says, okay, you may not see it yet, but if you believe before you see, that belief will give you permission to explore the possibility that that new story might be true after all. Um, and so to me, that's uh, we, have to, we have to find a way to flip the wonder switch back on, but we have to allow the presence of wonder to give us permission to believe in what we have yet to see. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think we are suffering often in leadership from a lack of imagination. And, you know, you think about the need we've all had in the last year to pivot. It's like, ah, I think there's been a lot of adaptation, not a lot of innovation yet. Perhaps that's to come. Uh, mm -hmm. But we're focused on our constraints rather than the possibility. And I love category breaking thinking. I love, you know, and as you get older, I have a lot of friends, I'm in my 50s, like who have kind of stopped dreaming, stop imagining and everything's managed and controlled. And to me, that seems really boring. Um, I love I love the possibilities of life. Can you talk about what a what a crucial leadership skill that is for all the leaders listening uh, to kindle this? And 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 maybe I, I'm sensing that you say this is something that can grow. This is not a static thing, right? So what sure. what can they do to stimulate their sense of wonder and imagination and possibility? Yeah, you have to get back to the magic. You know, you've got to figure out, and if you've lost it, go back to your origin story. What was it that made you fall in love with this thing that you're now in to begin with? Um, you know, it's once we start to believe in that magic again, that's when we move from that childish mindset to that childlike mindset. It's when we move from a limiting mindset to a wonder mindset. It's when we stop using our imagination uh, to worry and fear, and we start using our imagination to dream and create and innovate. Um, you know, it's, I keep going back to that. I know a lot of it's just semantics, but the people that are, um, you know, staying put and making assumptions instead of innovating, all they have done is allowed the dark side of their imagination to go ahead and write the story. And what that, the story their imagination is writing is they're going, okay, I'm imagining what the future looks like and I don't like it. I don't think there's anything good there. I don't think that that's possible. And so, because I don't like how that story ends, I don't like what my imagination is telling me. I'm just going to settle for a fake counterfeit instead. And if you don't want to take agency over the story um, and realize that you have more control over the story than you realize, then there are plenty of people in this world that will gladly write the script and shove it into your hands, right? Mm. So if I'm like, hey, Carrie, you've been cynical lately. You don't know what to do. Guess what? I'll be glad to tell you what to do. Exactly, right? exactly. <laughs> wow. So here's the script. Just fall into this role. Follow the instructions. They're all right there on the page. Uh, and then just kind of keep going about it that way. But your job as a leader and what I think all great leaders do is go, wait, I'm going to tear up the script. Yeah. I have a blank canvas. I have the opportunity to write the story. And right now we're in this unique liminal space. I don't know if you're familiar with liminal space. It's something that more no, people... No, not really. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, it's been talked about by everything from architects who talk about, you know, the spaces between like lobbies, hallways, elevators, okay. and a hotel, for example, um, to uh, some old spiritual thinkers and mystic um, leaders who are, 
essentially view it as this really holy space between the no longer and the not yet. And so liminal space is kind of like when we're stepping out of something old and we feel called or led into something new, but the old thing isn't really gone and the new thing isn't really realized. And so we sort of sort of feel trapped in the in-between. So that space between no longer and not yet, we have the old story and the new story. The liminal space is where cultural anthropologists would say there is no story. Well, if we go back to earlier, if we're storytelling beings, as I was saying, if that's who we are, and there's no story, but we don't feel anchored. We feel like we're floating through space. And I think that's the space that a lot of us feel like we're in now between the old story and the new story, because what's old is gone, but what's new hasn't feel like it's arrived yet. So what do we do when there's no story? Well, what leaders do is we write one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm not sure... <laughs> However, why don't we head in this direction? I think it could be interesting. Yeah. yeah. When you look at, uh, I mean, look throughout history. You know, one of my favorite, there's a quote in the film Saving Mr. Banks by Disney's character. And supposedly the screenwriter wrote it based on listening to lots of interviews with Disney talking about the role that he felt like storytellers played in the world. And Disney said in that film, that's what we storytellers do. We restore order with imagination and instill hope again and again and again. And I love the idea because I think, because again, I view leaders as storytellers. That's what great leaders and storytellers do today. Even when Martin Luther King walked up to a microphone and said, I have a dream, that was him restoring order, looking at the world as something that he felt was broken and thought, I need to restore order. Again, as Disney said, I restore order with imagination. I'm going to tell people a story. It's not real. It's this fantasy, this imagination, this idea that I have in my head of what I think is possible. And then he did what great storytellers and leaders do. He, is ex he extended his hand and invited the people listening to that story to come be a character in that story to help him create that new and better world. And that gave them hope again and again and again. JFK did it. JFK did not yeah. want to go to the moon, but yet it's a part of his presidential legacy. But he botched the Bay of Pigs invasion during the Cuban Missile Crisis he went to his administration and was like, I'm getting raked through the coals in the media. This is not the legacy that I wanted. What do we do? What do we have? We, we need a new story. And they said, well, we've got, the, we got the lunar thing that you didn't care about. You didn't care about going to the moon. And he's like, bring us that, right? And that's <laughs> the true story of how we ended up in the moon is JFK needed to awaken the wonder of America and offer the world a new story, something that would stir their imagination and give them hope again. And he united us and... He didn't get to see it in his lifetime because he was assassinated, but that legacy lived on and we accomplished one of the greatest acts of human achievement in the history of the world by sending a man to the moon. So oh, wow. great leaders restore order with imagination and instill hope again and again and again by offering people a new story and inviting them to come join them and be a character in that new and better world. This has been so powerful. And it's uh, my, my mind is still racing in a million different directions, but I'm going to give you the last word. Anything else you want to say to leaders to encourage them? Oh, man, keep doing what you're doing because we need you. Uh, you know, we need leaders to step up and lead. And instead of falling prey to cynicism and complacency, to dig deep and find the magic. And we often think we have to go on this grand epic adventure to find the magic again. And that can certainly help. But if you don't have that resource at your disposal, remember that the magic is in the mundane. It's right in front of your eyes. We just can't see it often because we don't believe it's there. But seeing isn't believing. What we believe has the power to change what we see. And when you believe in magic again, it will reawaken your wonder and you can lead the way that you were meant to lead. Hey, can I, can I bounce an idea off you? It's okay if you say it's totally crazy, but uh, <laughs> I started gratitude journaling about 18 months ago. It's been really good. And uh, but I was listening to a podcast recently. I listened to too many, so I can't tell you exactly which one. But uh, it was someone who had interviewed Walter Isaacson, who did the biography of Da Vinci, which is on my shelf behind me. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he reminded me is that the reason Da Vinci was so uh, prolific, one of the reasons, was he was a great question asker. And I thought, instead of just three things I'm grateful for, I think I'm going to write like three questions every morning. Because I think curiosity, uh, you know, I, I see curiosity as the antidote to cynicism. And uh, I, I, one of his questions is, uh, had something to do with a woodpecker's tongue. Like, whatever happens to the woodpecker's tongue? And it's like, <laughs> who would, what adult would ever ask that question? But like, he did a study of the woodpecker's tongue. And he doesn't have like, 
high yeah. high speed photography. He doesn't have any of that. So he just studied woodpeckers for a little while and then went on and did something else. And I thought, I got to come up with better questions. And uh, any thoughts on whether that might be a fruitful discipline, three questions in the morning? I think it's great. I think you should do both, actually. And yeah. that, the reason I say that is there's an entire chapter in the Wonder Switch book on what I call a wonder mindset and how to develop a wonder mindset instead of a limiting mindset. And in there, I talk all about the observation of Leonardo da Vinci and the science behind the power and role of gratitude. Uh, oh, wow. So I think if you do both, both are key components of living a life driven by wonder. Wow. That is going to be fascinating. Uh, the book is out in October. Uh, you are known as Harris the Third, one, two, three, like just Roman numerals. And uh, where can people find you online? Yeah, I'm at Harris the Third, just Harris III, as you said, on all social media. My personal site is Harris the uh, You can learn more about story by going to storygatherings.com. And yeah, I'm the founder of a little consulting company and innovation lab known as Astoria Collective. And that's just Astoria.com. I-S-T-O-R-I-A. So, awesome. Yep. Well, Harris, it's been amazing. Thank you so much. This has been uh, very, very stimulating and a nice beacon of hope in uh, a time where we really need it. It's been an honor. Thanks for having me. So much respect from afar for what you're doing. Thanks for leading with wonder. Thank you. Well, I hope today's episode was helpful to you. You can always get more by subscribing to my channel. I also have a lot more content over at kerryneuhoff.com for leaders in business and leaders in churches. And uh, you can get transcripts of this episode there and so much more, plus some other stuff I do for leaders. So head on over there to discover more at kerryneuhoff.com. And in the meantime, I really hope our time together today has helped you lead like never before.